Hello, OIS podcast audience. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you again today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Rob Rothman. I am a clinically practicing ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist by training. Uh, I spend about 50% of my time engaged in uh, direct patient care, and the rest of my time is spent uh, running InFocus Capital Partners, uh, which is the general partner for InFocus Fund One. Uh, my partner, Ron Weiss, and I are both ophthalmologists, and we've uh, structured a venture capital fund that invests purely in ophthalmology. Our first fund is currently closed and contains 13 assets. Uh, we are in the process now of structuring uh, and about to begin the capital raise for Fund 2, uh, which will continue the model that we've uh, engaged in previously, which is to bring a high-quality team of uh, key opinion leaders, uh, ophthalmic business executives, and finance professionals, uh, along with a clinical research organization to try and provide high-level diligence and make smart investments in ophthalmology to help both patients and our investors. Um, I know some of you have heard me speak before, and I've had the opportunity to speak to many uh, interesting people over the course of the past uh, few years, um, and today is no exception, um, trying to broaden the scope of uh, people who I think are critical to uh, the building and development of the investment culture in ophthalmology. And, and one of those people um, who will be talking to you today is Keith Valentine. Keith is the uh, chief executive of Fight for Sight Vision Foundation in the UK. And it has long been, um, I think, uh, I don't know if problem is the right word, but it's certainly been an issue um, where access to charitable dollars uh, to support development in ophthalmology has been difficult to come by. And uh, those those problems exist uh, in the UK as well. So um, it's a pleasure to have Keith here today. We're going to go, he's going to let him tell you all about himself uh, and why he's, uh, um, hopefully somebody's going to help lead the charge uh, over in England. So Keith, thanks for taking the time today to speak with us. Hey, yeah, look, pleasure to be with you and, uh, you know, fan of the podcast. So it's uh, it's great to be here to um, talk through some of these issues that I think we share an interest in. There are exciting times ahead. Save the date as OIS returns to Israel on November 7th and 8th for the prestigious Mixi Health Tech event. This annual gathering of international delegates is a valuable opportunity to forge connections and see all the exciting innovations coming out of Israel. Join OIS as we present a track that spotlights Israel's most promising ophthalmic startups. But that's not all. On December 1st and 2nd, OIS 13 returns to San Diego. Our 13th flagship summit unites corporate, clinical, and capital leaders driving novel therapies for both the front and back of the eye. You'll gain perspectives on addressing unmet needs across all of ophthalmology and optometry. Registrations and applications to present at both summits are now open. Head over to OIS.net and click on events for more info. Your path to innovation begins here. So Keith, one of the things that I think is amazing, and we're going to talk all about your background, and I'm going to like, I'm going to ask you to give us a, a whole bunch of background, but um, you are the first and only visually impaired head of a national sight loss organization in the UK. Is that correct? Yeah, that is that is correct. Uh, there are some other colleagues in regional organizations much closer to community activities, but in terms of the national picture, yeah, that's sadly, that's, um, you know, that's true. I take no pleasure in that. So can you tell everybody a little bit about your background, sort of, uh, you know, uh, where you grew up, what you studied in school kind of stuff and how you ended up doing what you're doing today? Yeah, for sure. So I, I grew up in a town called Walthamstow, which is in the east part of central London. Um, I, I am from a family that have had uh, orthosomnal dominant retinitis pigmentosa, which is traceable at the Moorfields Eye Hospital back to 1850 through the genetics project. So there's been a lot of us going blind in every generation. Um, in the city. I um, come from quite a complex background, um, a working class family. Um, I was the first uh, of my family to go to um, university, um, which was a, an unusual choice because none of us really knew what the university entailed, not having any social capital in that space. So quite a surprise when I, uh, when I, when I made it there. Um, I moved fairly swiftly post-university to look to um, develop a career in business. I was an entrepreneur. Uh, essentially. And then for the first career I had in my life through my 20s and 30s, I ran a uh, initially a startup business that grew fairly swiftly in what in the UK is called the regeneration market. So that's that's working in areas of 
social deprivation, uh, poor quality housing. Um, actually visited, it's part of that role, I visited some of the projects in New York, some of the developments there, but our, our job really was to raise the capital, work with developers and state institutions to get the money flowing to turn those areas around and make them viable socially and economically. I never expected to work for a charity. Um, if I'm honest, I thought by this age I'd be uh, away in the Mediterranean on my yacht and, and <laughs> having a bit. Um, That's I thought I'd... funny, me too. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do say careful what you wish for, right? I mean, exactly. I, I, was sail- I was sailing on a 21-foot boat last week on my, uh, <laughs> on my break, not quite the yacht I was, I was dreaming of, right? Um, but yeah, so I kind of I, I, I got to a point with a company where we, we had to make some big decisions about mergers and development um, and then I had a, a really bad six months with my eyes and lost sight significantly um, unfortunately for me kind of three four five years before uh, iPhones and that accessibility revolution that came with the digital device um, revolution and um, sold up which was the right thing to do I have to say it gave me a year or two to you know properly consider you know how I go forward and I'll be honest within that there was some pretty dark well, not just dark days, or some dark periods of time as I as I tried to adjust. Um, but, do you mind um, telling people what your condition is? Do you do you have any issue with discussing yeah, it? No, 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 not at all. No, it's, so it's it's I've well, I've got a, a mixture of things all consequent on the uh, also some dominant uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Um, I've also got Charles Bonnet syndrome, which I don't know if any um, anyone's familiar with. It's just essentially it's an effect of the loss of. Um, the macular field, which causes uh, hallucinations. Um, Oliver Sacks had one of his case studies in uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and if you remember that book, one mm-hmm. of those, Charles Bonnet syndrome, sufferer. Um, and then all the other things that you'd expect, so risk of the, t- the retina, had a few scares on that, and cataracts over the top and all the mixture. But I'm pretty much barring some kind of peripheral vision, which is quite unusual with RP. To all intents and purposes, I'm now blind. And um, I have, a, have the luxury of a guide dog, Dottie, that's asleep next to me here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's a big it's a big moment in time because I think that, that, you know, if I could, you know, go and give advice to the to the guy in his early 30s thinking of selling this company and he might not be able to go on, I would say just pause a moment before you do that and, and stick with, um, you know, stick with your work in the commercial sector because, it, you know, I can see now with the technical and technological environment we've got, everything's possible, but... It felt like too steep a hill for me at the time. And eventually I decided that I was going to have to go and work for someone else, which is, I'm not sure I've ever entirely got over that. <laughs> my own <laughs> for 15 years. Um, but yeah, and it, 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 you know, just literally through a series of um, accidents, I, I, I ended up working in the sight loss sector and, and being visually impaired myself. More that I'd gone to talk to leaders in that sector, expecting to meet people that were blind and visually impaired to figure out how they did it, you know, and, considering whether I went into business or tried a new venture in business or whether I went to actually work in an organization and found fairly quickly there were very few of us around in that sight loss charity sector that um, actually themselves had had um, visual impairment. So I kind of went to find out what you'd do if you worked in leadership in a charity and they hired me into a leadership in the charity <laughs> within six months, which was, um, you know, I mean, it was great and I'm grateful for the people. But since then, um, so I'm pretty much the last 15, 16 years I've 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 worked in leadership in in the social sectors relating to sight loss and disability um, in the UK. And still now, even though my commercial career is a fair way behind me, get you know referred to and identified as the guy that came from the private sector to, you know, to work in, uh, you know, in charity, which is yeah, I'm just kind of I, I kind of like that, you know, there's some validation in that. And I think I my approach to the function and role that charities play, I think, is is slightly different because of that. I'm, you know, I believe charities exist to reach for an impact, and that they should structure, organise, and operate in a way that that delivers that in, impact without fear or favour. And um, I've certainly found. I mean, there's incredible people working in the charitable sector in the UK, particularly in the sightless sector. And none of what I might say to this point and others today is a criticism of that infrastructure. I simply believe there's something fresher required to start to channel charitable funds in a way that creates a proper economic dynamic and particularly towards treatment and let's get into right so let's get into that in a minute i want to ask you a couple of questions first because i think that you know you and i have spoken you know previously about about some of these issues and 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 i want to get to all those but tell me about the current um 
sort of structure and scope of the charitable circle in the UK that uh, addresses, you know, sight loss and, and ophthalmic disease? How big is it? And what, what what are we talking about here? How large is is Fight for Sight comparatively? How much money do you distribute? I think people need to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the, the, the sight loss sector in the, in the UK splits into, I mean, there are multiples of small local community-led organisations, which I think are kind of out of the scope of what we're talking about here today. Right. You, you know, you, you can factor those assets in, but they're never going to be able to be turned to anything at a national level. So the national sector itself is wor worth, I mean, depending on how you slice the cake up, between 300 and 350 million um, in total. Now, the thing I think that's unusual in the site loss charitable sector compared to those other, you know, areas, health areas, if you look at, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's or, you know, cancer, heart, stroke, those sorts of areas, that the, by far, the bigger organizations in that space are providing services and are, are focused on lived experience. So it's kind of the reverse of what you'd find in some of those other um, health, disability and disease areas. And the, the slice of that that's investing in you know, discovery or translational science, science is actually tiny. Um, so, you know, the total value of the national investment going in from independent charities into Eye research in the UK is and again these figures can vary depending on where you draw the line, but around 15 million uh, pounds a year, which is you know you can I mean you know, whether something's a lot of money or not depends on where you stood, but you know you stand from the point of view of impact of what needs to be done in the world um, in terms of investment, it's 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 minuscule. So that's an interesting concept. I mean, it's an interesting problem that you just discussed, and I think it's part of the reason why it, it's so great to talk to you. And and, and when you think about that. Alloc and and there, it doesn't mean that there's one you know avenue of of allocation that's more important than other. Obviously, helping people with sight loss and who who need services and support is a critical function. But as far as uh, investable dollars to go towards potentially treating or curing those diseases, right? You're talking about a tiny fraction of the amount of money that's actually spent. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's, it's, and there's a certain amount, you know, hands up, there's a certain amount of emotion, you know, somebody's from generations of people going blind. I, you know, I, I, I know from visceral personal experience, my daughter's diagnosis during the, um, you know, the lockdown, you know, she was, she was on her own in a hospital, in a corridor, and she found out she had it because she overheard people reading her scans and had to get home across London on her own on a train, wearing a mask, crying down the phone. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of big, you know, for those people right. that are, experiencing that and you know the the it's true of well with my daughter's diagnosis and um, you know i think in remembering what happened to me personally as well as i was diagnosed as a child that there are two profound questions that occur and they're inseparable and the first is always can you stop it happening can you stop it happening now inevitably what comes with that as well whether it's you or your child that's getting the diagnosis you think well how am i going to live with this and i think if you think you know, forget sight loss and think of any condition where you're sat in a, you know, in a consultant's office and they're, and they're giving you a, a diagnosis of a condition that's going to impact your life. Those two questions are, 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 you know, the natural human reaction, a composition and the way they occur and how they occur over time are different for different people because we are different, diverse people. But at root, the, the simple fact that those two questions are inseparable, if you map that then across how the charitable infrastructure is set up to make its investments, that first primary and profound question for you or your child, can you stop this happening, is, is not being addressed. And I think it's I think I think that's a that's a really important thing to understand how that infrastructure has developed over time, um, you know, in the UK and where the big institutions have, you know, have, have, have grown up into the service space and into the how do I live my life space. And in part that well, that, that could well be because of where the science was over the period of time when a large you know, um, growth occurred in that charitable sector serving, you know, serving sight loss. So arguably you could say because of the potential that's in science and some of the deficits that are in there in terms of, you know, discovery science and where charitable investment is targeted and the scale of that charitable investment to de-risk and enable, you know, proper commercial dynamics towards uh, treatments is, 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 is our launching point. You know, it's, it's you know, you, you could, I could, you know, I'm a user of services that are provided to blind people by charities and you know the dog that the guide dogs association gave me has been 
utterly transformational to my life. I am the last person in the world that wants to stop that happening. But it, I make the simple point that that deficit from the charitable side is a deficit that will be felt by the investor community, that will be felt by you know, the scientific community. It will be felt in terms of the sustainability of science in the UK and the attraction of people into you know, ophthalmology as a viable profession for their you know, their commercial and their, you know, and their scientific interests. So it's, it's, it's something that I believe is fundamental to identifying what I also believe charities exist for, which is impact. So my organisation exists to save sight and change lives as a consequence of that. And the impact we want is treatment in the hands of ophthalmologists so that these conditions have such significant impacts on people's capacity and ability to progress in their lives are, you know, are taken out of the system. And that, that, that thinking like that, is so redolent of the the way that we approached impact when I was setting up my business years ago. You, you, you know, you, you're thinking about what is the impact we want. What's what what is the role for our business that in itself can draw resource together in order to you know create an enterprise. And I, I you know I feel that for the charity that I run, whilst we're not looking to you know raise capital for the reward of our shareholders through delivering dynamic products, you know our, our the capital that we're wanting to raise. Ultimately, if you'll forgive the use of the word capital in that way, is, is the impact, is the treatment, is the, you know, the, the reduction in impact of, you know, of eye disease. And I, I think that there's, you know, it strikes me, I mean, I'm finding conversations with colleagues in the US, in the charity sector, a, a bit more dynamic than we're able to put together in the UK. But I see the prospects of, of, of organisations starting to think about these things, you know, that we're raising. But I suspect the moves that we need to make because we're as a growing organization you know just on a merger we've got more money available over the next three years to you know to invest we run a reactive grants program for science i think we need to look at how these additional investments we have are put to that cause which has to be new it has to be a new approach and it has to be approach that in my view cannot proceed successfully without a dynamic relationship to the investor community. Um, and also, I think, with the scientific community and to some extent, state and policymakers in the way that they structure their investment as well. I, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating, um, you know, it's fascinating listening to you. And I, and I will admit with full disclosure that I am not um, the world's expert on accessing charitable resources, um, you know, as an investor um, in ophthalmology. I hope that during a diligence process, we identify leaders who are capable of accessing funds from as many possible sources as they can as they can to try and propagate their business. And one of those is the access to the charitable world. And, and I've had some unbelievably, incredibly rewarding experiences with some of the bigger charitable entities in the United States. You know, there's Foundation Fly, Fighting Blindness and there's the Glaucoma Research Foundation. And there are organizations, even within the big you know, ophthalmology membership groups like the AAO and ASCRS who have some sort of foundational work that they do and supports their own mission. But I would agree with you that, and again, this is just my perception. I don't know if it's fact that um, the amount of dollars that flow towards um, startup science from foundations is significantly less than comes from the investment community. Yeah. And, and that's not, I guess it's not surprising but I think that as you as you've stated, there's a big disconnect between what those funds in the charitable world are raised for and how they're allocated. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on how to accelerate or what your plans are for accelerating the investment into the science space. And are you going to build an investment committee or do you have an investment committee? Are you going to reach to outside sources? Are we going to be looking at deals together, you know, in focus? And, and, you know, fight for sight UK, are we going to be making investments together? Is it going to be a diligence process to share? What are your thoughts on how to sort of get these two worlds to intersect a little bit more meaningfully when it comes to the investment in science? Well, look, I mean, all of what you described there is possible. Um, where I think we're at is a, a very, uh, we're at the point of inception. And I think the most important thing for us to do, I mean, we're, we're distributing two million pounds a year, which is it really, really important to those scientists that apply for it, but nowhere near the scale of investment that's needed um, you know, in the wider community. And I think the way we believe there is opportunity for us to significantly grow the amount of money that the trust we have with the public um, can draw into the science and the discovery phase of, 
of science. So we've we've got a job to do in increasing our our value to the system and how we're able to invest. I think we also need to establish where we fit in that value chain. And I, you know, we are as an organisation, we've been in part. That's the second time I'm going to mention the, the pandemic. I apologise for that. Will we ever get past it? We've been <laughs> no, no, part, keep going. It's yeah. great. But, I mean, we're, we're, I mean, still like here, lot, still here yeah. a little bit. <laughs> Economically, for sure, it's still here. So don't worry about well, it. We're all, yeah, we're all, we're, yeah, we're all feeling. It. I mean, right, right. I'm trying to sell the house at the moment. You know, I'm feeling it. Um, but the, 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 I mean, the critical thing. I took over here 18 months ago. Um, you know, we had a we had a staff of four. Um, well, our donor profile was holding up, but it was nowhere near the strength it had been rolling into that pandemic period. And I had a job to build a new company, new organisation, new charity, to you know to get the kind of growth and create the platform that's going to enable us to participate in that value chain and not just be. You know, I don't I don't just want to be a guy who's got an analysis of the system that's going to turn up and talk about what should happen. Right. I mean, you know, there's enough. When none of us short of ideas, are we? No one needs that. I think the job I've got to do initially here is to build a platform that's capable of doing two things: one, having the cash in the bank so it's able to make the investments, and two, engage with the system to establish where that fits in the value chain in order to, um, you know, ex- accelerate the realization of some of these opportunities that I think we all of us um, investors in particular are starting to, you know, to see in the system. So the route by which we do that, whether you know that is about investing alongside each other. Whether that is about you know us creating a you know a fund that's capable of de-risking um, early stage IP, so that you're actually got a way of processing some of these opportunities to get ready for investment. All all of this is is, is possible. The job we've got to do, I think, mean, my principal focus at the moment is, is is those two things: is getting the relationships right, but in the knowledge that we've got, I reckon, what, eighteen months, two years before we're um, we're investing. Even then, even after that growth, uh, around ten million a year. Right? So it's still, you know, um, it's you know, and, that, and that's quite that's quite a tough job job to do. And I think it's I'm really really acutely conscious that because I'm I'm, I'm not a lone voice in this space, and we've got people inv- involved, you know, across governance communities in different charities that are starting to look at these kinds of relationships. But I am acutely conscious from my own work in building a business that um, we knew when we turned up and tried to cut a deal even if there was a risk in that deal that we could follow through and that we were able to deliver on what we were talking about and i think one of the things i you know the fact that this bit of the sector the 15 million that i talked about is small that also has a consequence that it's had difficulty attracting um commercial talent into its into its makeup it's to some extent relatively immature in the way that it builds partnerships with commercial organizations so there's some work to do if you like in you know making sure we are seaworthy i would put it put it out you know um but i can't help shouting about it and talking about it you know so i've got to find that balance you know i'm not going to shut up because it's important and i think that things are missing in the system which means that ip is undercapitalized and it's, it's not possible to break out from some of these um opportunities into com- you know, in, into the commercial processes and ultimately into the hands of ophthalmologists for impact do you think do you think that there's some relevance and and do you expect and, and this is a question i'm asking you personally i mean i have my own thoughts on this but nobody cares what i think most of the time anyway but <laughs> but i but i i i and i i see that this trend is happening a little bit but don't you think that as a charity that you should have the ability and the opportunity to um, enjoy some of the rewards from early investing in science, the way that you know venture capital investors like us might, if there's success inside the industry. Everything does everything have to be a grant, or can you be a equity investor like the rest of the, you know, uh, sort of syndicate that ends up funding uh, early stage companies? And therefore, gain reward for your own uses to make more investments down the road. In general, yeah. you know, grants and non-dilutive funding have been sought after by companies um, because you know, obviously, they preserve the capital structure of the entity and allow the company to move forward. But why shouldn't you be considered an equity investor like anybody else? And is that something that you see, you know, fight for sight taking on as a, a little bit of an internal mandate as you as you move forward through this process of raising capital and then deploying it? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, that precisely in the zone of defining where we fit into the value chain. So, I mean, we are, we, we do, um, we hold stocks anyway, as a matter of how we hold our reserve. You know, we, 
you know, these numbers will sound minuscule to people, but we have about 8 million in a portfolio, you know, that's out, that's out in the markets and that isn't targeted in any way towards ophthalmology. That's just, that's, that's there over time to sustain um, the organization. And then we have our grant programs. And as you say, if, if, if our, you know, if we're starting from the point of view of this is the impact that we want, where do we fit into the value chain? I don't think you go far into that without thinking about our role as investors. So the strategy that we will, um, publish in the new year as we rebrand, having just merged two organisations, we'll talk about us as an investor and starting to think about how we structure ourselves to to make investments. And that transition is is something that needs to be dealt with very very cautiously. And whilst you know, charity law in the US and uh, Britain is 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 you know is different, I think both have similar restrictions on the approaches you can take to be an investor as a charity. But none of those are insurmountable. Um, I think the the case that needs to be made across those investing organisations in the UK is, 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 is simply that it's, is it desirable or not? And certainly from the debates we're having about how Fight for Sight develops, it, it is desirable. It's about the right route to do that. Now, what I what I wouldn't want to do as an investor is simply to be, you know, another, you know, one of a number in a consortium. Right. Cross their fingers in hope because we've got some great IP and we'll see how it goes. I think the risk is easier for us to handle um, because of the way that we attract capital and and there being no uh, commercial necessity for us to secure, um, you know, secure a return. But I I I, I think you know, in, and I'm I'm speculating to some extent because this is work for the next year. But I I suspect our role as that type of investor would be where we could essentially de-risk in environments where you're putting together um, consortia for investment or you know, approaches around particular IPs or whatever else. Um, I also think there's something interesting about our role as a, as a grant-making investor in, in a value chain of development. So where, for example, there are, um, you know, there, are, there, are, there are prospects for developments that could lead to IP, where there are def- there's definite alignment with the VC interests you know, in a, in a particular, I won't pick a particular disease because no doubt someone will be more knowledgeable than me and then it'll fall apart. But where you've got a, a particular line of inquiry, where maybe there's an injection for something that's transferable from another area, the IP's out there, there's VC interest in that. But this initial check, this bridge you have to get over to make that commercially viable for investment and for being picked up. I think there is something for us to do in starting to align our investment as part of a chain towards the realization of our IP. And if it fails, then it's a grant, right? And we've made that investment and we've learned because it's failed. If it succeeds, how we partner with potential um, potential VC companies to make sure that that IP is then realized. So you can, you know, from our point of view, if you know that investment will lead to something that should it be proven, people are lining up to take forward, that accelerates our route to impact. And at the moment, we're not making any investments of that nature at all. We are purely investing against scientific propositions. And as I say, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't want anyone that listens to this that's a grant recipient to think that we're going to change that. This is about what we do as we grow with additional investment. We will continue that grant regime, partly because the limit funds from charities into the scientific sector mean that, that, that you know, we are vital to the sustainability of um, you know, about ophthalmology and the science around ophthalmology in the UK, even though it's a small amount of money, we're often the critical, you know, we're often unlocking the doors on the labs, you know, so that the, 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 the projects can work, go forward. You know, we're paying uh, money into PhDs, fellowships, these sorts of things. And we can't turn away from that. You know, it's a long standing commitment. So this is about growth on our own part. As I was saying before, principal job here, get more money and then identify our place in the value chain so that that investment is you know, made to sweat, you know, as far as we possibly can towards impact. Well, that's the, so that's, you know, look, I'm used to this. So, so, you know, don't take it, don't take it, you know, in any particular way, but it's clear that I am not the smartest person in this room with the two of us. So, and I'm used to that. So don't, you don't have to worry too much about that, but, but it's an incredibly prescient, uh, you know, vision that you have for the value of your organization. And, and, and I couldn't agree with you more that where you insert yourself into the investment life cycle of any opportunity dictates how that investment is structured. And, and, it, and I would agree with you that 
as a charitable organization, you have the ability to do this in multiple different ways. You know, you can be a grant giver to somebody working in a lab to help them propagate something useful. And that may be purely designed to, to move the science forward. But you can also be an equity investor in a round where the expertise of the organization can um, lend credibility not only to a, a, a process that's moving forward, but can also provide access to resources outside of dollars, especially when it comes to conducting research in the UK. I mean, there's so many different places where you can interject the, the charitable money. And I, and I sort of feel like that trend is taking hold to some degree with some of the organizations we've dealt with in the United States. But you're right. There's no investment value in providing services to somebody who's also lost vision, but it is unbelievably mandatory that you continue to do that. But one of the ways that you can generate more money for that purpose is to create a significant return on the investment side of your business. And that's where I, I feel that this you know, most charities have to go out every year and try and raise money and raise money and raise money because they're just giving it away. Well, you can also give it away in ways that can provide significant return. And I think that from what I'm hearing from you, it seems like what you're going to be planning on doing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we we get, you know, we, we do have some return on IP. Um, you'll appreciate with the, I mean, I, I think we've got 118 grants out at the moment. And in that portfolio, it's discovery science you know there's a hell of a lot of failure that we learn from but we do you know we do get some return from um the share of ip that we get because of the way our grants are you know are, are structured so whilst we don't own the ip there's a there's a structure in place there so we get a certain percentage should things um, proceed towards um, treatment but i think we're talking about you know i think i think that's something we want to maximize we want those systems to work well i mean i don't want any pound that goes out of this door to to be detriment to the impact that we're trying to achieve and it's inevitably where there are opportunities for us to get a return from that so we can further invest then we do it it has it has to be clear what i think slightly slightly different and where we need to take a slightly longer run up is where we're actually uh, you know you know we're actually you know we're investing alongside vc to make things happen and i think that's i think that's what well, twofold firstly very very exciting and has huge potential and is 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 new territory in thinking about how organisations like ours work, and secondly, requires great caution and great planning, so that we don't. Um, you know, I mean, I suspect with environments like this, which aren't exactly fertile for these ideas, they just show the opportunity for growth. But we've got to make the ground fertile. I don't want to. I don't want to snatch at something because it feels right and find we've you know that we fail that we you know and the, an old british phrase that we come a cropper you know up against it with uh, regulation or that we have any um, you know significant problems in the relationship with our donors because there's some perception that we're starting to pursue things for you know for profit and you know our our key asset for the growth of our income is the trust of the people that, that, that right. donate to and and the generosity that i've seen since i've got here you know including people you know donating substantial amounts of money from you know, from their from their will and legacy and um you know even through these periods i mean in the uk we've got substantial amounts of um stuff high levels of inflation at the moment post pandemic there's a few social problems at the moment political uncertainty people are still giving us money and i and i find we're 13 percent up year on year uh you know on income i remind people that's 13 percent of the <laughs> not as much as we'd like but it's still yeah. in a difficult uh market and we 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 must not lose line of sight to that so you know where we design approaches to investment which um you know i, th I think with the right I, I think for me it's literally just about structure building the right partnership finding the right associate organizations to work with and, and, and structuring things so that the mechanisms you know serve charitable interests and in the way that charitable regulation works in the uk but people don't give us money for all of that and all that technicality they give us money because they want treatments they give us money because they have often interjected or specifically within their families, people going blind and they live and breathe the impact of that every day. And they give us money because they trust us to use that to get those treatments into the hands of ophthalmologists. And I think for me, that, that, that will remain at the heart of every decision I make in leading this organisation is to honour that commitment. And honouring that commitment is twofold. It's the right thing to do morally. Um, and also, if you, as a donor to a charitable cause and I donate to other charities, uh, you know, myself, what I want to see is them taking the pounds that I give them and, you know, turning them into 10 pounds of value, you know, in the way they deliver outcomes for people. And um, yeah, 
I mean, if we get that right, people will, will you know, down the community will widen and we will draw more money into the system. I got to tell you, I mean, I, I, I hope that, you know, as we're sort of out of time here, I hope that you use this podcast for your own purposes when it comes to raising money. Because I think that anybody who's potentially thinking about making a donation to, you know, Fight for Sight, hearing you, how you're going to approach what you're doing um, is going to be compelled to give you to give you money. Because to me, and again, as a as an ophthalmologist, a provider of care, as an investor in, in ophthalmology, what you just described and the mission that you've set for yourself could not be more appropriate and and more thoughtful. Um, and you know, I, I I hope to God that we're able to work together, um, both as I- investors uh, down the road, because I think that um, you're going to not only be successful in raising capital with the attitude that you have, but, but, but clearly that you're going to, you're going to have a significant impact. And it, it's just, it's just glaringly obvious that, you, you know, to anybody who would listen that you have the, the proper mindset, proper focus, uh, proper motivation, not only on, on a, on a personal level, but um, from, from your past experiences with, with visual loss in your family to, to, to make this work. So I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, like I said, I'm not, the, I'm clearly not the smartest guy in the room here, but I think you're in, in in a great place and on a perfect path. And I couldn't be more, you know, privileged to know you and to have had this conversation. And um, I'm, I'm anxious to follow up with you over the next, um, you know, few years to see how that growth has, has propagated. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to work with you going forward. Hey, look, I'm planning to get to the States next year. I'll, I'll buy you a coffee or a glass of wine. Where you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we have a mutual friend, right? So, you know, Indeed, we'll, get Paul, yeah. we'll get Paul to pay for it. He owes me a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah. this yeah, point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Keith, thank you so much for taking the time today. Again, Keith Valentine, Chief Executive of Fight for Sight, Vision Foundation in the UK. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to speak with you uh, and to the OIS podcast audience. I'm looking forward to future conversations down the road. Thanks again, Keith. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.